Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Our speakers today are Dr. Dan Butterman, along with one of Henry Schein's CAD CAM training specialists, Kat Snyder, and they'll be discussing dental CAD CAM blocks and cements, and specifically how Carrari is changing the game for chairside restorations. At any point during the webinar, we do encourage your participation. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section, and we'll answer them live at the end of the webinar. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Carrari. So with that, Kat, take it away. Thank you, Adam. Um, a little bit about myself. As Adam stated, I'm a CAD CAM trainer with Henry Schein Dental. I started in the dental field when I was 18 years old, back in 2003. So I have been in this field for approximately 18 years now. I started using CAD CAM in 2011 and have been training with Henry Schein for about three and a half years. Dr. Butterman, who's with us today, he's going to be sharing some clinical results and go over some finishing protocol and some of the cementing as well. He was actually my original trainer. So he is my favorite of the CRF doctors. There are many, many good CRF doctors, but he's definitely the best. So we'll introduce him in just a bit. On the agenda today, I'm going to cover the chair side blocks that Kurore Noritaki offers and go over the required equipment and software that's needed to fabricate the material. Dr. Butterman is going to then cover the finishing protocols, cementation with Panavia SA. Um, and then he's going to share a little bit of his uh, clinical studies and advanced characterization. And we're going to finish up with about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So if you do have any questions throughout, throughout this webinar, please feel free to write them down, put them in the uh, chat box, and we will try at the very end to go over those questions with you. The two blocks that Karore Nortaki offers are the Katana Evincia LT. That is their hybrid ceramic resin block. It's coming in at 233 megapaxels. They have two block sizes available, the 12 and the 14. There are three shades available, all LT shades, meaning lower translucency. And this is going to require the 4.6 software or above. There is no oven required for this um, material. You do not want to put it in your oven. It will melt to a little blob of um, nothing um, due to the resin that's in the block. The real star of the show here is going to be the Katana ZRSTML. In the uh, industry, when you, re when you hear a katana crown or somebody is referring to um, a katana restoration, typically they are referring to the Zirconia STML block. This is 859 megapaxels. They have three block sizes available, 14 shades available, and this is going to be requiring the 4.5.2 software or above. It is going to require a centering oven, and we are going to cover that a little bit later on which ovens um, you can center this material in. A little bit about the material, it can be centered in as little as 18 minutes. Again, it's the 859 megapaxel strength. It is a multi-chromatic layer with no gradation gap. So that's really what's going to give you that natural aesthetic appearance, replicating what would um, the layered porcelain would look like without actually going through the process of layering porcelain. The zirconia powder is uniform in strength. So regardless of whether you're going to be using the more translucent area of the block or the mo more chromatic area, it is uniform throughout that block in strength. Karori has been manufacturing this material since uh, 2007 and has been used in labs all around. It is not a new material, although it is um, a little newer for the chair side dentist. It did come out in 2018. So that's approximately three years that it has been available for same day dentistry. But this material has been used in dentistry since 2007. It has a uh, broad list of indications. This is really a great material for your bread and butter dentistry. Um, th this is one of my favorite materials to bring to new users when I go into training an office because it's such an easy material to use. It has a lot of products to manufacture it, and it is um, just a really simple and efficient material. 
All right, I'll the mills. Um, here, if you are a serif user, you are likely uh, using one of these three mills. A lot of these mills have been on the market for quite some time. So we're going to just talk about the process in each one really briefly. The Cyric Prime Mill, it has the ability to super fast mill zirconia. So that's going to be your four to five minute milling time that you're hearing a lot right now. It also has the ability to do an extra fine milling. So that's just going to add a little bit more detail um, in this block. This is already a very detailed mill, though, because this is milling in a very choppy, uh, fine state at approximately 20 to 25 um, I can't think of the word, Dr. Uh, Butterman. What is it? Shrinkage rate. There it is. So it is milling. Thanks for your help. <laughs> it is milling um, already pre I got you. Add anything you need. <laughs> um, if you are um, milling it, you do want to mill it dry if you can, which means you're going to have a vacuum hooked up to your mill somewhere to um, give you the ability to mill it dry. If you are milling dry in the MCX or the MCXL, you're gonna be using the Shaper 25 and Finisher 10. But if you are working with an older mill unit and maybe you don't have the dry mill capabilities, it is possible to mill this wet as well. We are just going to swap out the 25 for the 25RZ. So pretty much any syrup mill is able to mill this uh, material. Now, if you were working with an even older Cerec mill that doesn't have the ability for you to insert those carbides into the unit, you can grind this material using the step burr and the cylinder pointed burr. When you are picking the material in your admin um, tab, it will give you the option when choosing zirconia to either mill or grind. And this is really what it is referring to. Milling, we are talking about carbides coming through and slicing that material and grinding is going to use porcelain diamonds to grind away the material. So ideally we will mill, but if that is not a possibility to you, you are still able to manufacture this material using the grinding option. There are some things to take into consideration when you're milling wet or grinding, and that is the water tanks. There is possibilities of contaminants. So sometimes just adding an additional tank to ensure that your water is clean is going to give you a better process. Now we're going to look at the block sizes available here for the Katana Zirconia block. We have the 14ZL, which is your bridge block, the 14Z and the 12Z. The 12 and the 14 is really um, indicating the post centered size. So if your restoration height is less than 12 millimeters, then you are going to be able to fit in the 12Z block. This is probably the most common block that I see used is the 12Z. It does have the ability for the super fast milling if you're using that prime mill. It is the only block that is indicated for the super fast milling. Um, and if you don't have a restoration, and on, on CIRIC, you are able to open up cursor details and it's going to show you right then and there what your height of the restoration is. So you can quickly decide which block you're going to use. The 14ZL, L meaning long, is um, the bridge block option, and that is going to require the 5.1 software or above. Next, we're going to look at the shades here. There are 14 shade options available for this block. And down here on the lower left, I really like this uh, diagram because it showed visually, I'm a very visual learner, and it showed visually what those shade um, layers indicate. So on your software, you are able to take your block within that, um, the restoration within your block and move that up or down depending on what the patient needs. So if you are moving it up and you need a little bit more translucency for the cups, uh, for the cusp, just keep in mind that that um, strength is uniform throughout. So it does not matter whether you move it up or down. The lines here on the screen are really just a visual aid so you can see where you're at in the block. There are no gradation gaps in the block itself. Now that you have your block and you've milled it, it is going to come out of the mill. It's still attached to the screw in the ingot. You will need to make sure you're using uh, gloves, to minimize any cross-contamination with your oils or lotion on your hands. So you don't want to make sure that you are wearing gloves during this process. We're going to remove the block with a lab hand piece using approximately 5,000 RPM and some light 
pressure. This comes out of the mill in a very chalky, kind of like a, it's a little harder than chalk, but it is a pretty chalky, it's a soft state, um, which we refer to as the green state. We're going to clean up that screw area, just polish it off. The one nice thing about it being so soft is it's very easy to remove this screw and polish it up in this state. Once you have the screw removed, you're just gonna dust off any excess powder and it's ready to go into your sintering oven. The speed fryer is going to center this in 18 minutes if you are using the 5.1 software. Um, and if you're using an older software, it will also do it 18 minutes if it is three millimeters or less. The CS4 and the CS6 are also um, centering ovens that are available to you. So you can get the firing um, parameters from Karori if you are going to be using one of those ovens to program the oven. This does not require any putty in the oven. Do not put the putty in the oven. It will be a melted mess when you open your oven. You're just going to put it upside down, no putty, um, on your little firing tray, and you're ready to go. Now, there are other options. Um, typically, I choose to just do the polish and seat, but there are other options if you do have a particular single unit anterior and you do want to stain it, there are options for staining. This here is the CSR paste and Karori has made some great maps on their website for you to follow. It takes a lot of the guesswork out when you're staining these um, restorations. And I'm sure Dr. Um, Butterman has some fancy stained teeth to show you as well. And this is just the glaze option for CSR. The CSR, there's a few options to glaze. Um, but on the Karori website, they are using the maps using this staining and glazing process. Next, we're going to cover the polishing technique, which Dr. Uh, Butterman is going to come in and cover that for us. We've got his block up. He's really streamlined this process and made it really effective and efficient for his um, office. So with that, Dr. Butterman, are you ready? I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to you. Kat, that was great. That was really good. That was good information. Thank you. And I and I was uh, flattered about the, about you calling me your favorite. I just wanted to repeat that in case people joined a little bit late and didn't hear you call me your favorite. So, uh, you know, it's great information. Let's let's get into zirconia a little bit here. I just want to. Um, I think I I think I have a slide about me just a little bit. The only thing I really want you to know about me, the group that's on here right now. Uh, one of the things that I do is work for CDOCs. So I teach all of the level CEREC courses. So if you've, if you've been to CDOCs at our, at our institute in either Scottsdale or Charlotte, then you've probably run into me. If you haven't, you eventually will. Um, one of the other things that I spend a lot of time with is beta testing. So what that means is that I understand on a very deep level what the software is doing, why it's doing it. Um, I understand if things are user error or if these are real technical problems with the with the materials or software or hardware. Uh, so I hope, and I know there's there's a, a fairly good sized group on here. So I hope you'll take advantage of, uh, and it doesn't just have to be what we're talking about right now. But but please please ask in the in the chat because like like I get lonely when I don't see chats or questions or any of that. So please reach out if you have questions as we're going along. But let me just kind of jump in. I'm going to back up just a little bit from where Kat was talking about, why zirconia? Uh, you know, when zirconia first came out, I thought, well, well let me rephrase. When, for, when zirconia first came out on the Cerex side, the very first zirconia that we had available that some of you might have used is Cerex zirconia. So what uh, Densply Strona did was they took a bunch of beta testers and they brought us out uh, to Germany to show us this zirconia and we milled it. And if anybody's ever used Cerex zirconia, it's really opaque. I mean, it's like almost embarrassing to place it in the patient's mouth. So when we actually did this, when we milled it and we tried it, all of us were like, eh, who cares? And Dense Blasterone was super upset because they're like, they thought we would love it. They're like, you guys love zirconia, don't you? Well, so then I got back to my office and I thought I would try it. Here's the thing about zirconia that kind of surprised me is that the milling process is quite different. That burr in the milling machine on the top or the tool on the top that you see, that wide diameter one, 
that's used for glass ceramic. That really small tin finisher down below, that is what is used for zirconia. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a much more detailed mill. Um, you're gonna be able to have a much more accurate mill. So the big things for me, as far as why I like zirconia in general, and we'll get into katana in a minute, is that the prep is easier. Um, we don't typically need as much reduction because the, uh, the, the strength is so high of the materials. The margins are super precise. We're just not gonna have chipping that we have with glass ceramics. The accuracy is gonna be there because we've got that small tin finisher that's gonna be able to mill all of that great anatomy. And then non, not only is it gonna mill great anatomy and, and be able to do and, and get into all of the roughness that maybe we've left on our preps, but then the block's gonna shrink about 25% in the oven. So all that detail is gonna get better. Um, it's just gonna get finer. So the fit is just insanely good with zirconia. But the big one was that you can cement it. Um, and when it, comes to, when it comes to bonding, and I'll talk a little bit about bonding later, bonding used to be one of those things that if you've been in CERIC for quite some time, you think, oh, bonding's fine. I've been bonding forever and, and I have no problem with it and it's not a big deal. But as soon as somebody comes along and says you can cement, you're like, oh my God, I hate bonding. I never want to do it again. Um, and that's kind of the way it was, but things have improved and things are changing quite a bit about bonding. So when zirconia first came out, I accepted it because of the fit. I didn't love the aesthetics. Um, it, was, it was very, very poor early on with this. I just wanna spend a minute talking about zirconia in general because there's a lot of zirconia on the market um, and there's going to be even more coming onto the market and there are major differences between the materials. So I just wanna go over zirconia, what it means from a chemical perspective just for a second. So zirconia exists in three states. You've got a monoclinic state. That's the state it wants to be at at room temperature. It's useless for us in dentistry, though. It's too weak. It does nothing for us. Then we have tetragonal zirconia. Tetragonal zirconia, on the other hand, is incredibly strong. Um, that's that really, really opaque, super, super strong stuff. Maybe you've seen the original Bruxer crowns from Glidewell where the guy takes a hammer and hammers it into a board, and, and it's just unbelievably strong. You can't break it, but it's super opaque. It's not really, really aesthetic at all. And then we have cubic zirconia. So the way it works is that zirconia will exist in different mole percents. So if you take zirconia, monoclinic zirconia, and you combine something called yttria to it, and you combine three mole percent, that's where three Y zirconia comes from, then you're gonna convert most of that zirconia into tetragonal. Um, so you've got that super, super strong, super opaque material. If you increase the amount of yttria, so now instead of three mole percent, you go to four mole percent, well, you're gonna take some of that tetragonal zirconia and you're going to convert it to cubic zirconia. You guys know cubic zirconia. My wife knows cubic zirconia as well. She just doesn't realize she knows it, but it's one of those materials that are really translucent, really, really pretty, but we lose some strength with it. So the way companies are dealing with their zirconias is they're playing with those ratios. And as you add more, five more five mole percent of yttria, you increase the amount of cubic zirconia. So the balance, the hard part here is that the different manufacturers sort of want to find the sweet spot. They want to find great strength, which means they need tetragonal zirconia, and they want to find great translucency, which means they need cubic zirconia. And it's playing with those powders, getting those ratios just right that gives you kind of that combination. So that's where Katana kind of kind of took over the market because if you think about it, Katana, it's not the strongest block on the market. Um, there are other zirconias that are, that are certainly stronger, but I think a lot of us that have used it will agree, it's strong enough. Um, it doesn't have to be bulletproof for every restoration you put in. It's not the most aesthetic block on the market. There are translucent um, uh, ceramics Feldspathic materials that are very, very translucent. They're very, very pretty, but it's pretty enough. So the way I see it, and I think a lot of you will agree that have tried Katana, it's kind of that Goldilocks material where, where it's just strong enough um, because it's going to be able to handle pretty much any clinical situation. And it's aesthetic enough that you're going to be able to pretty much use it in any situation um, as well. And I think that, uh, that the, the, the cool thing about this material, the STML is super translucent, multi-layer zirconia. So we have multiple colors, multiple layers going through this material. Uh, and then on top of that, we've got a, uh, the ability to adjust the chroma and the translucency. So if you take your block and you go to the manufacturer phase, 
you can actually move your restoration up or down within the block to increase or decrease the amount of translucency. Um, and that's really, really nice because we're going to be able to we're going to be able to basically polish most of our restorations and have a aesthetic result that's going to be that's going to be nice. So Kat mentioned the uh, prime mill. Uh, the prime mill has sort of been a game changer because I'll be honest with you, when I beta test materials and I look at and, and trust me when I say I get a lot of new blocks, I get all material. Basically, I'm going to have a material about a year before it's going to hit the market at least. And we go through testing. When it comes to a material that's going to work in my office, the timing, the entire manufacturing phase of that material needs to be under 30 minutes. If I'm going to schedule a crown for about 90 minutes total, that entire processing time, which means milling and oven time, really can't be much longer than 30 minutes. If it gets longer than that, then it becomes uncomfortable to fit into my 90 minute appointment. So one of the things that the prime mill did was they introduced super fast. So super fast milling is going to allow me to use some new tools. Um, it's not really, it's super fast as a marketing term. It's really called parallel milling. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, but we've got some new tools that are gonna be specific to the prime mill. Um, this is what it looks like. So the reason it's so fast, <laughs> sorry, I'll turn that down. The reason it's so fast is because we've got both the external and the internal of the crown being milled at the same time. Um, that's where that parallel milling comes in from. So that's where we're going to have a huge, huge increase in speed of milling times. So we're going to end up with a situation that if I fine mill it, it's going to be about maybe 17 to 18 minutes. If I super fast mill it, I'm at four minutes. I can also extra fine mill this. And extra fine milling is only going to be just a little bit longer than fine milling. Extra fine milling with a, a, um, a prime mill, just to be totally clear with this, will only improve the external smoothness and the anatomy. It does nothing to improve the fit. So the fit is going to be just as good whether you extra fine, fine, or super fast mill it. The surface texture is going to be much better if you go to fine or extra fine. It'll be a little bit rougher, so you're going to have some more polishing to do um, with this material. So typically, most posterior restorations, if I'm going to deliver it same day, it's going to be super fast because I'm going to be able to mill that restoration in about four minutes. And as Kat mentioned, that's going to go into the speed fire in 18 minutes. So I'm kind of, if I'm going to polish this restoration only, I can mill it, I can pre-polish it, which I'll go into in a little bit. I can fire it and I'm all in and done in about 25 minutes total processing time. So some of you using Emacs in a speed fire, for example, if you place Emacs in a speed fire oven, that's going to take 24 minutes just to crystallize it. I can mill it and center zirconia um, in the time it takes just to crystallize Emacs. So that's kind of huge having that kind of restoration processing time that's so fast. Just makes it more efficient. So let's talk about pre-polishing. And this is something that I've been working quite a bit on. Um, and it's something that I feel is, is really, really important. Uh, not so much that pre-polishing is important. What is very important is having a polished surface. So this was a great study. Um, I know a number of you probably know Nate Lawson and John Burgess. So these names are, are familiar to you guys. This was a really, really good study. And one of the things that they found was that if you polish zirconia, it will create a more wear friendly to the opposing tooth. So it'll cause less damage to the antagonist tooth if, if you polish it as opposed to glazing it. Um, so my preference is going to be to have a well polished surface because you know, you know, think about zirconia, it's so hard. So if you, if you take glass ceramic, for example, and you leave it a little bit rough and you place it in the patient's mouth, it's going to cause some damage to the opposing tooth, but it's not going to do it forever because that glass is eventually going to wear. It'll self-polish. It'll kind of smooth off that surface just from function. Zirconia, on the other hand, is so hard that if you leave roughness, it's never going away. It'll cause damage for the life of the restoration or the life of the antagonist tooth. Um, so it's really, really important that we have a smooth surface. Now, it doesn't have to be polished before you center it, but if you think about it, it's going to go into an oven and the thing is going to get ridiculously hard. So if you need to polish it anyway, my preference is going to be to polish it in the green state while it's still soft. Now, I need to warn you that there's room for error with this. Um, you can cause damage um, and, and you can certainly you can certainly chip a margin or you can gouge the material. You can remove too much material if you're not careful with this. 
So it takes a little bit of practice if you're going to pre-polish your restoration, but I think the payoff is, is going to be worth it. Um, this is just a kit I put together with Meisinger. Uh, the only thing I got out of it was getting my name on it. I think my name's on it. I'm not even positive that they did that. Uh, I guess I just didn't negotiate well on it, but, um, but thanks anyway, Meisinger. But the cool thing about this is that we have relatively few instruments. So we're gonna be able to separate the restoration from the block. We're gonna be able to remove the sprue. We'll be able to pre-polish, we'll polish, and then we'll do a final polish. And then we'll go over it one last time when it centers. So let me show you what I'm talking about. And just let me know if these, uh, if these videos are playing well. Don't break your crown off the block. I want you to cut it off the block with a lab handpiece. And it's probably a good idea to put something up underneath when it comes off. And then we're going to remove the sprue, remove the excess, lots of different ways to do that. So we're just going to take off what's the gross part of the sprue that's left, and we just want a lightly polished surface underneath it. Now, if some of you want to take it at this point and just put it in your oven and center it and polish it afterwards, fine. Fine. Um, you're not going to cause any risk. You're not going to cause any damage. You're just going to have more work to do afterwards. My preference is now to come back with a blue spiral polisher. This is from Meisinger. And it's just going to take the burr marks off. This has nothing to do with aesthetics at this point. All I'm trying to do is remove the roughness and remove the scratches. I want to be careful not to be too heavy handed with this. I'm running this at about 10,000 RPM. I don't want to take touch the contacts. If I hit the contacts with this blue, this uh, pre-polish, it's going to open up those contacts. So I'm just doing the occlusal surface, buckle and lingual, and I'm just taking the scratches off. This is not polishing at this point. So we want to be a little bit careful and not put too much pressure. Now I'm gonna come through and polish it. So I'm gonna use the red spiral polisher and this one is going to now start to give it a little bit of a shine. Um, and I gotta say, Katana is probably one of the zirconies that pre-polish better than any of the other materials that I've seen. Uh, and it really, really is quite easy to pre-polish this material. Again, I would rather not touch the contacts with this. You probably could, but, but I, I just don't wanna take any chance of opening it up. So I'm just going over the same surfaces that I did with the blue spiral polishers. I'm just gonna take off, I'm just gonna go on the buckle lingual occlusal and just make sure that uh, we're starting to polish it. And then I like to take it one last step. Now I'm gonna use my high shine polisher. And you'll notice once we go over this with the high shine polisher, we're really going to start to get that wet look. And it's kind of cool because we're getting this wet, fully polished look in the green state. We haven't even centered it yet. This one, I will polish the contacts. I have no concern polishing the contacts um, at, this, at this point. And it's at this state where I'm gonna put it in the oven. So we're gonna do as Kat said, I'm gonna use maybe some compressed air. I wanna get rid of any powder that's still on there. Maybe we'll use just a, a soft brush and just, just take away any of the zirconia dust that's on there because you don't want that to bake into the restoration. And then we're gonna run through and center it. And when it comes out, you're pretty much done. Um, at this point, the only thing that I need to do when it comes out is go over with that same last step and just give it that final wet look, that final gloss. Now, if you don't want to use a spiral polisher, you can certainly use something like a diashine paste, a diamond impregnated paste. I think uh, Carrari even makes a paste that works quite well for this. And all I'm doing, it's gonna take me probably 30 seconds to do the final polish here. Um, and you'll find that this is going to be a very smooth, and now, now yes, it's shiny. Yes, it looks almost glazed. But the point of this is that I don't want to cause damage to the antagonist tooth. So if I would have left this a little bit rougher, and maybe I would have put a glaze on top of it, then eventually that glaze is probably gonna come off. Um, glazed to zirconia just typically doesn't last that long. And once it comes off, you're gonna have a rough surface up underneath there. So you just have to have that smooth surface. And if you're gonna get it, I would encourage you to maybe try doing that at the green state because you can do the exact same thing. You can use the exact same instruments after it comes out of the oven um, once it's already centered. But think about it, it's hard, the material. So you're gonna be working harder, you're gonna be pressing harder, and what's the risk of pushing too hard, creating too much heat when you're polishing is you tend to create more of that, that weird kind of opalescent sort of a, a, a look that a lot of zirconias can get to by, by over polishing. So I feel like we're going to reduce that risk quite a bit in the uh, pre-polish. So just a real quick case, because we can also, and this, is, this was kind of new for me, uh, zirconia was a posterior restoration only. 
Um, that's where it lived in my office and it was great for molars and I used it on first molars, second molars, but anything forward was always going to be Emacs um, or a glass ceramic because I just didn't feel like the, the aesthetics were there. I gotta say Katana is kind of changing that a little bit for me. Now, when I do in full, full honesty, when I do use it for anterior restorations, when I come premolar forward, I normally also do put a little bit of stain and glaze. Um, I don't feel like a, just a polished restoration is going to be enough. Uh, so this is John that that came in, and John is John is in his mid sixties, and his big concern was that uh, that he just looks old. His teeth are making him look old, and if we take a look at his smile here, we've got his two front teeth, and I, we won't look at everything, but just his two front teeth, his, his length to width ratio is too big. They're 92%. Ideally, we want something around 77 to 80%. So our tooth doesn't look too wide or, or, or too tall. We want it to be just right as far as our proportions are concerned. But he had a failing bridge from nine to 11. Um, and, and if we saw the lingual surface, there's porcelain that he's worn off of that bridge. Uh, and he's just got a lot of things going on here. So we're going to make a couple crowns for him and we're going to redo his bridge. I didn't feel confident because of his history of breaking teeth of going with Emacs for the anterior bridge. So that was kind of the reason on this case where I made the decision that I'm going to do zirconia. And really my choice was, was Katana if I want to have a chance at the aesthetics. So this is what made him look old. Um, this is really, for those of you that are doing any cosmetic treatment at all, the lip at rest photo is a, a really, really important one. So we just didn't show enough tooth. And if we wanted to improve his length to width ratio, and I see his lip at rest, I can see I've got some room to work. Um, number number nine was probably about the right length. We may be able to get maybe another millimeter or so, but really he wasn't showing much of anything else. So beyond the scope of, of what we're talking about today, but just to kind of give you an idea that with Sarek, we can do some bigger cases. Sarek is not just a, a posterior single crown machine. Um, we can do all kinds of things. So I just removed his old bridge. We prepped number seven and eight for crowns. And now we have nine through 11. You see the spacing was really tight. He had a lot of, he had a lot of occlusal and parafunction issues here. Uh, whenever I do anterior cases, I like to do diagnostic wax ups. So the way I do a diagnostic wax up these days is I'm going to scan the patient. I'll scan their pre-op situation. I'll send that to my lab through Connect. And then my lab is gonna do a digital wax up for me. It's rare that they're actually gonna do a physical wax up anymore. They'll do that digital wax up and they're going to send me an STL file. An STL file means that they can just email it to me and now I can print his diagnostic wax up. We can do this in about a day. Uh, and, and have our diagnostic wax up ready to go. So that just makes this case really easy because we're just gonna do this as a file copy case. So now just using his diagnostic wax up, it's just a matter of drawing copy lines and moving through and getting our proposals. And really the only thing I did on his proposals here was tweak the Pontic a little bit and adjust the contacts. So again, with the Katana bridge, those layers of translucency become even more important because I want to be able to have some incisal translucency with us. If I don't have any incisal translucency, then the case looks dead. It looks it looks flat. It just it just doesn't uh, it doesn't really pop. Uh, one of the cool things, also again beyond the scope of what we're talking about, for those of you that have in lab software, you have the ability to take these models and you can build these Geller models, which are are basically models with removable dyes. So when I'm doing bigger cases and I'm gonna do some stain and glaze, especially if I'm not delivering it same day, then typically I'm gonna to want to print one of these models. I can typically print it in about 30 minutes or so. And then I can do my contouring, adjust contacts um, and check everything with that. Uh, but this is how we finish the case. So, so this, is, uh, this is where we ended up with it. I've got a little bit of stain and glaze. Um, I do have a polished surface here and a little bit of stain and glaze with it. So to my eye, I think we've got a restoration and the patient was really, really happy with that. I was really surprised with the translucency we ended up with. Um, we've got a high strength material that was really, really nice and translucent. And this is the picture that I really like because this is his lip at rest now. Um, and he just, just sitting there with his lip, just covering his teeth, he just looks younger. Um, and that's, that's the comment that his wife made is that I gave him a lot of years back by doing that. Uh, and, and it was kind of, it was kind of fun doing that. I don't know that I would have had the longevity if I used Emacs on this case again, again, because of his parafunction. 
Um, we're probably about about a year and a half to two years out on the case, and he's doing great and and super happy with it. So I just want to mention bridges in general because you know katana in the interior. I used to do my go to was always to do Emacs in the interior, um, and it, and it just was it was just katana was going to be a posterior material. Maybe it was going to be premolars, but I just didn't love it in the interior. If I took this design and I milled it out of Emacs, and some of you have done that. That's how it comes out because glass ceramics are going to be using very large diameter tools and it's just not going to be able to mill the surface detail that you can do. So I love using zirconia for bridges in the anterior uh, because the way they're going to come out is much different. So if we took this exact same case and instead designed this and milled this out of a katana block, here's how it comes out right out of the mill. In about five minutes, I can just do a very light polish, just a little bit of contouring on this restoration. I'm going to center it. And then after I center it, and, and I don't have enough time to go over the actual steps in it, but I'm going to use a CZR stain and glaze paste. Uh, I don't like to say which materials are, are my favorite um, because there's a lot of materials that work really, really well. Uh, but when it comes to stain and glaze, I mean, I got to say that the, the, the stains on this, the tints of this, have ceramic built into it. It just goes on really, really well. I'll be honest with you. I kind of use this stuff on everything and, and it works It works really, really nicely. So you can kind of see that you can quite easily bump up the translucency. You're not actually seeing translucency here. This is just a painted on kind of a grayish color to it. We create more separation by taking a darker color and painting that interproximally between where our Pontic and crowns come together and a little bit of a darker color on the gingival. This took, this took probably five minutes um, to glaze this. So we're gonna basically run this through the oven and center it the first time and then do a second glazing cycle. In my Speedfire oven, that glazing cycle is about eight minutes. Um, so it doesn't really take a, a tremendous amount of time to, uh, to come back over and, and do that. So if you haven't played with this stuff and you want to start getting into Katana for more aesthetic restorations, this is kind of, it's kind of a requirement as far as I'm concerned. Pre-polish and polish only for all of my posterior restorations. But as I start moving into, into more of a cosmetic look, then I do want to use a, a glaze with a little bit of stain um, on top of that. I haven't, I don't have my Q&A up here. Any questions coming through here, guys? I, I'm assuming no, because somebody would have interrupted me. And if you guys do have questions, just, um, um, just call them out, because I don't think I have the ability to bring up my Q&A. Kat, I'm watching you. Any any questions nod your head yes or no? There are no questions, no. No questions? Is it because everybody's logged out or they've just fallen asleep? You just covered it so well. Oh, okay. You covered we'll go, everything. We'll, we'll go, we're not done. We're not done. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about bonding. Um, you know, bonding is kind of one of those things, again, where it's super confusing. If you just... If you if you if I, if I pull up my phone and I Google just the words technique sensitive, nothing to do with dentistry, but just Google technique sensitive, uh, you're going to have a ton of stuff on dentin adhesive bonding because it's complicated. We have so many different choices. There's so many different steps, and and there's problems that can come about. One of the things that happened for me early in my career with Sarek is that that my front office person Patty. Um, Patty and I sort of have a, uh, how can I say this, a love-hate relationship. Uh, actually, there's, there's no love at all there. Uh, but but, uh, but Patty, Patty came up to me relatively early in my, in my career with Sarah, and she said, I don't know what you're doing, but I need you to stop it. And if you know me, that could be like so many things. It could be like really bad things too. But, but so I asked for clarification. I'm like, what are you talking about, Patty? She said, well, we've been doing crowns forever. But now with Sarek, since you started using that, I've had a ton of patients calling with sensitivity and it's really getting annoying because these patients are calling and they're sensitive and I need you to stop it. So the issue is it's complicated and you can have these problems with sensitivity because there's so many different steps. There's so many different procedures to do. And when you're new to bonding, that's when you can kind of have these sort of issues. Um, and I'll get back to that conversation in a minute, but you know, we've got this whole spectrum. Does everything have to be bonded in? Do you have to be able to lift your patient out of the chair by their restoration? Does it have to be in that tight? Well, it depends how you prep. If you do a conventional prep, 
and you've got a strong material like katana or any of the other zirconias on the market or even the high strength ceramics, well, then you can conventionally cement those. Now, if you're prepping a flatter prep and you don't have enough resistance and retention form, well, then yes, that then absolutely you need to you need to go to bonding. So, so kind of the thing that's changed for me is that our new materials, and I'll go over one in just a minute, have become so easy that we can almost now bond with basically the exact same steps and same ease that we were conventionally cementing. So if I can do that, then yeah, I might as well. I might as well start bonding. And, and really one of the things that, that I think a lot of people like these self-adhesive cements on the market because those sensitivity issues that I described kind of go away. Um, because what causes sensitivity? A lot of things cause sensitivity. Are you etching? Are you etching dentin? Are you etching enamel? How long are you etching for? Are you placing adhesive? How long are you scrubbing it onto the tooth? Are you air drying it? All of these things come into play. So with these self-adhesive cements, a lot of that goes away. Um, and we just don't seem to have those those sensitivity issues. So I want to talk about the cement that I've, I'm kind of I've, it's kind of a good cement. <laughs> if I'm if I'm being honest, I'm a little bit excited about it because because it, it it it's one of those things that allow you to get that high bond strength and not have to worry about uh, things coming off. And then cleanup is super easy. So Panavia SA for self adhesive cement universal, and it's called universal for for a couple reasons. So my goal with cementing, and the reason I like cementing is because basically I can take my crown, I can load it with the material, I can plop it into place, I can tack cure it, and I can pop the cement off and move on my way. I don't have a bunch of other steps that I need to do. And it's kind of almost that easy with this material now. Uh, it becomes confusing with how do you treat the materials that we're using? How do you treat zirconia? How do you treat glass ceramics? And how do you treat the tooth if you want to take these restorations, because look, our restorations, we can make the best restoration in the world, the most adhesive, or I'm sorry, the most aesthetic restoration, the strongest restoration. But if the thing doesn't stay glued into the patient's mouth, then you failed. Um, so, so what does it take to keep it in there? So there are zirconia primers. There's silane for glass ceramics. We now have new materials that are going to combine our zirconia primers with our silane for our glass ceramics, and things are getting easier and easier. The reason the cement is called universal is because it takes those primers, it takes our zirconia primers, our glass ceramic primers, our dentin and enamel primers, our MDP and our LCSI, and instead of putting it in the bottle, it has now mixed it and combined it in with the cement. Um, so that becomes pretty interesting now uh, because all of those steps, those room for, for mistakes and, and error that we had then, then you know this is this is going to correct a lot of that because it's just milk mixed in with the cement. So we've got MDP in here. That's what you're going to use to bond zirconia. It's going to stick to metal. It's going to stick to zirconia. It's going to stick to enamel. It's going to stick to dentin. And then it also has the LCSI. That's what you would use basically as your silane step. That would be the step that you would traditionally use for your your glass ceramics like Emacs or your resin materials like Avencia. Um, so these are the materials that, that require a silane, and both of those steps are built in here. The other thing is this universal bond quick. Um, Clearfill universal bond quick has sort of changed things because I, I talked about patty and I talked about sensitivity. The biggest mistake that I made, and, and here's how I corrected my sensitivity issue, or one of the ways I corrected it, Apparently that adhesive that we use on a lot of systems, it needs to be scrubbed in for 20 seconds. Um, and so what I did was I, I said, okay, I told my assistant and I said, um, hey, Danny, we're gonna, we're gonna bring in these egg timers and, and we're just gonna time 20 seconds with my adhesive so I can make sure I scrub it in. So she's like, okay, fine, we'll do that. And so she starts the timer and I say, okay, just, just start it and, and I'll start scrubbing it in and just let me know when 20 seconds is up. And so I'm doing it and I'm scrubbing it and I'm scrubbing it in. And, and I look at Danny and I say, do you not understand how to work an egg timer? And she looks back at me and says, it's only been five seconds. So if you haven't timed 20 seconds, it feels like forever. Um, and, and it's kind of hard to get your head around. One of the reasons I love this stuff is there is no waiting time. Um, this is, by the time you get it on the tooth, there's about a three second scrub with this material and you're good to go. Um, air thin it and you're good to go. This will increase bond strength. Do you need to use it? If I have a traditional prep, 
And in a conventional prep, long axial wall height, maybe four millimeters or taller axial wall height, then I probably don't need to use the step. I can probably just take my restoration, load it with cement and seed it. If I have a shorter prep, because a lot of times the reason I'm using zirconia is because my, my, my tooth is relatively short and that's why I, I just needed for material thickness and I want to have a higher bond strength to, to dent and enamel, then I'll add this clear fill universal quick on top of it. Um, and I can get my head around three seconds versus 20 seconds a lot easier. So the cement is again, it's going to be able to, to be able to be used on two zirconia, metal titanium, Emax, composite, any of the porcelains. And the materials that are in here that's allowing this to occur again are MDP and LCSI. So we've got both of those built in. So we don't need that separate step. And when you have a separate bottle, when you have a separate step, it's more cost, it's more room for error, it's misunderstanding which one do I use on what material. So basically we're just gonna load the restoration, I'm gonna seed it, I'm going to tack cure it with my light for about two seconds. And this has got a really nice rubbery stage. It's kind of an extended rubbery stage. Some of you have used some of the older cements, like for example, just to, just to maybe throw Ivoclar under the bus a little bit, they're old multi-link cement. Um, really, really strong, good cement, but the problem is you hit it with the light, and then you go and try and clean it off at the rubbery stage and you're like, no, it's still soft. It's still, it's, it's still runny. So you hit it again for another second and the thing is so hard, you're now cutting it off. Uh, so this material has got a fantastic rubbery stage. So if I go a little too short, or a little too long, it's still gonna be easy to clean uh, and we're good to go with it. Now you still do need to treat the restoration itself. Um, if I'm doing zirconia and I wanna get a great bond to it, then I'm going to air braid it. I'm going to micro etch it with aluminum oxide, uh, about a 50 micron grit. And then if I try it into the patient's mouth and I contaminate it, then I'm going to clean it with Katana cleaner. Katana cleaner is basically just going to take the phosphate ions off. The phosphate ions are in blood, they're in saliva, and it will prevent the bond of the restoration. So we're just going to use that to clean it. If I'm doing glass ceramics, I don't need to do the silane step. All I need to do is use my hydrofluoric acid. Um, so for zirconia and for the resin materials, we want to air braid it. For our glass ceramics, like Emacs, we want to hydrofluoric acid. And then we're just going to be able to load the cement and nothing else. So it just makes it easier. Uh, we're just not going to have all of the steps. There's not going to be as much room for error here. Um, I think I'm kind of running out of time here. Um, rather than show you this, one couple things that I want to mention just off the uh, off topic, just slightly. How much time do I have? Am I am I like done ish? You've got ten minutes left and no questions, so you're good on time. Okay, so don't ask any questions for a minute, guys, because <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you. I want to show you two things really, really quickly. Um, let me talk about this because this isn't so much related to katana, but it's it's a big one and it's bit me in the butt, and I just want to. I just want to give you guys some more meat that that are here because I think this might get you out of trouble sometimes. You guys ever placed a crown in and maybe a year or two go by and the patient comes back and they're like, hey, I'm catching food. And it's always, and you're like, I know I built it into a good contact and, and, I, and I know that there wasn't an open contact when I put it in, but after a year or two, that contact opens up. Basically the tooth is distalized. The only time I really ever see this is on a terminal tooth and I usually see it on maxillary teeth. So when you're designing your restorations in CEREC, a lot of people will look at the occlusion on this restoration and they'll say, oh, it's fine. Um, and they'll go ahead and mill it and they'll put it in. Don't do that because we have no idea if this tooth is gonna distalize. Why does it distalize? Well, of course it's occlusion. It's occlusion that's gonna cause it to distalize. So here's what I want you to do in your design. I want you with intention to build contacts onto the mesial marginal ridge and I want a contact on the distal incline of the cusp. By putting contacts there, you're going to have a force that's going to take this crown and it's going to seat it mesially. Alternatively, if you put a contact on the mesial incline of the cusp, or if you divide, if you draw a line and just, just kind of divide this tooth in half of the line, anything on the distal one half of that tooth, if you put a contact there, well, it's going to have the opposite force. So here's what it looks like when I'm doing my design. If I get a proposal that looks like that, I'm not going to accept this proposal. I'm going to use my shape and my circular tool. Um, and I like to turn the colors off just so I can kind of see the anatomy better and I can kind of see where those inclines are. 
Um, but, but then I'm just going to use my shape and my circular tool. And I'm going to go to that marginal ridge, that mesial marginal ridge, and I'm going to lift that up. Now, if you do double turquoise, so you've got two layers, now we have dark blue. Dark blue is not in occlusion. Um, it's, it's out of occlusion. Once you start going to this double, this two layers of that light blue, or, or what I call double turquoise, now you're going to start to get an articulating paper mark. So we want to build that onto the mesial marginal ridge, and I want to build that onto the distal incline of that cusp. Just those two marks, that's you're going to have articulating paper mark there. That's what's going to hold that into place. Uh, the other thing that you want to make sure is on a terminal tooth, you want to make sure that your contact is a little bit heavier. So if I normally like uh, a little bit of green on my teeth and it's going to be, or a little bit of green on my contact, I want to add a, a terminal tooth and make it a little bit yellow. So make it just a little bit stronger on a terminal tooth. And those situations are going to keep that locked in. That tooth is not going to drift and you're not going to open up that contact. Now, if you weren't paying attention and you just got a proposal and maybe you had some contacts on the distal half of the tooth like this, or maybe you got a contact on the mesial incline and we don't have a stop on that mesial marginal ridge. So something like this, this is kind of almost going to guarantee that that tooth is gonna distalize and this patient is gonna come back um, with an open contact. So pay attention to this stuff. Don't just accept the proposals on terminal teeth. Make sure that you're dealing with that um, and getting that right and make sure that your color is a little bit stronger. So what does it look like in the mouth? I'll go super fast. This patient just had a crown that, that I wanted to replace. And if I kind of look at it, you can see he, he, he had a gap. He was catching food in here. And you can see at heavy occlusion on the distal half of the tooth, there was no contact on the mesial and he was hitting on the mesial incline. So here's my design. With intention, I build stops on the occlusal surface on that mesial area. I wanna make sure there's nothing on the distal. And I put it just as I said, this is how it looks when I put it in the mouth. Those marks are going to be accurate. If you have that double turquoise and you put it in, you're going to be able to get articulating paper marks. And if you don't do this, then these are going to distalize. Um, last thing in my last minute, I'm gonna super quickly rush it because I know a lot of you guys are restoring implants and some of you are using Atlantis to restore it. One of the issues I have found with Atlantis, if you don't understand, if you don't know what Atlantis means, uh, this is a workflow where you're restoring an implant. You can take an IO flow that's an Atlanta specific scan body. You can put it on your implant. You can send this through Connect to Dense Plysterona implants. They'll design an abutment for you, and then they're going to create a core file. So this core file is just a virtual abutment. And the cool thing about this is you're going to be able to pull this into your Cerex software, and you're going to be able to design a crown. So what that means is Atlantis makes the abutment for you. They'll charge you about 200 bucks for the abutment. You make the crown yourself. Well, here's the issue. Some of these abutments are not ideal for our CEREC milling. And then I found that the anatomy is so sharp. Look at the margin with Emacs that's milled to it. Because we're using bigger diameter tools and we've got some sharp anatomy on the abutments, the margins just tend to not fit as well. That's why my go-to with any of these Atlantis abutments Whenever I can do it, I want to use Katana for it. So you can kind of see, look at the, this is the same restoration. Obviously, I haven't centered the zirconia crown, so it looks much bigger, but it's actually the same restoration. You can see all of that over milling that's going on on the Emacs one, and none of it is going on on zirconia. Just another one. This is a, a, a Celtra Duo crown. Look at all that over milling that's happening, and it's perfectly smooth because we've got that 10 finisher, those small diameter burrs the margins are just going to be insanely good with that. So Katana is kind of my go-to for that. It does a nice job of blocking out the titanium um, and that can work quite well. So Atlantis abutments, I've kind, of I've kind of shied away from glass ceramics with that. And my go-to is Katana, mainly for the fit. Uh, and again, I'm typically gonna do this as a, as a polish only type restoration. Okay, I'll shut up now. In our last five minutes, what questions? You can ask questions. I was kidding. I'll stick around here as, as long as anybody needs. Awesome. Like you said, we've got five minutes. No questions. I don't know what it is, Dr. Butterman. Every time you there lecture, are no some questions. questions. There are a couple questions in the chat. Right. 
All right, oh, let me hear uh -huh. the questions. Oh, I, maybe if I stop sharing, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then I think I'll be able to see the uh, the chat. Okay. Uh, it's so good. Don't stop. Oh, that's really sweet. Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, do you use the contact button to get your contact? Okay, so it's a great question about using the uh, the contact button. I love it for the occlusal contact. Um, I want to. I, I typically set my occlusion with my parameter so that I like it at at basically. Um, about minus 25. I, I know beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but my parameter setting for my occlusion is minus 25. So when I hit that occlusal contact button, it'll drop the occlusion to just right. I don't use it interproximally. If you use your mesial and distal contact button interproximally, it'll get the color right, but the size is not going to be right. Um, the contact is going to shrink it down. You might just have a pinpoint. So I want to have that nice broad contact and you'll lose how broad that is. So don't use the contact button interproximally. Um, that's it. I think that's it. Anything else? Okay. Well, you know, if you want more of this stuff, obviously reach out. You can reach me at, at CDOX. Um, my email address is just dbutterman at cdocs.com. Uh, so you can you can reach me. Uh, here's one. Uh, and Beth, you're real talkative. I appreciate that. I'm using self for duo and finding I have to aggressively reduce. Can I change my parameters? So that, that's a great question. Also, you're reducing and you're adjusting your, your prep based on parameters and minimal thickness that's built into the software. So for example, Celtra Duo is made by Densply Serona. They have set parameters that they sent in and it's locked in your software so that you must have 1.5 millimeters of reduction. Otherwise, you're going to see that blue bubble. Karari, on the other hand, only requires one millimeter of occlusal reduction. So if you were to change your material, maybe you set it up as Celtra Duo and you were to change it to uh, uh, Katana instead, you would see probably that blue bubble is going to go away because the minimal thickness parameter that's locked into your system is only one millimeter instead of 1.5. I hope that's clear. Other questions? Is that, is that dangerous? dangerous? Dangerous. You mean like, is the patient going to die? I would say, no, it's not dangerous in that regard. Um, but, but um, you know, the, the, you, you have to stick to the material. Um, so it is dangerous to cheat the minimal thickness with any of the materials. So cheating Katana's minimal thickness of a millimeter is dangerous, meaning that I wouldn't want to leave that, that blue bubble. Uh, will it weaken? The, yeah. So, so I, I can, I can pretty much guarantee you, well, I can't guarantee it, but there's a high probability Seltra Duo at under 1.5 millimeter minimal thickness will fracture at some point. I, I just would not, I would not, if you need, if you need to use a glass ceramic, I would pick a different one. Um, if you have those indications, if you can't, if you can get 1.5, it's great. Um, if you can't, then I would choose a, a, a different one. Am I missing anything else? Uh, you, you got if a it couple weakens. of What's that? Uh, she mentioned, will it weaken if she bakes it, the Seltra Duo? Oh, it, oh, if you bake it, uh, so, uh, so Celtra Duo, it, it achieves, think of it this way, uh, Celtra Duo will, will basically be full strength um, when it, it is in block form. As soon as you cut it and you grind on it with diamonds, you're going to cause micro fractures to the material. So it actually weakens because of the milling uh, or, or grinding process in the machine. The reason you put it back into the oven is that you're trying to, you're trying to heal those fractures so you will strengthen it. Uh, by by baking that, so that that material, if you want it to be full strength, it, it should be in there. All right, we've got a couple questions in the Q and A here. Uh, do you ever use True Abutman website for ordering tie bases with a variety of tissue heights? Yeah, I, I, I got to say that the 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 dense ply Serona tie base it, it's a it's a problem because you, as you're alluding to you can't adjust your margin away from the implant platform. So deeper implants, a lot of tissue around it, subosseous ones, I don't want my restorative platform. True abutments, tie bases are great for that. Um, so yes, I, I, I like to have the multiple platform heights. So for me, it's either gonna be, I'm either gonna send it to Atlantis and have them make the custom abutment if I want to have that emergence just right or probably be a, a true abutment tie base. All right, and uh, polish zirconia reduce wear against enamel. Do you use it in bruxism? Uh, sorry, does say it one more time. I was reading the question, not listening to you. 
polished zirconia reduce wear? Does pol uh, polished zirconia reduces wear against enamel? Do you use it in bruxism? Yeah, I, I, I have no worries. I, I would feel very comfortable using a highly polished zirconia in any situation. I'm not concerned that it's going to cause damage to the antagonist. That's not my opinion. Uh, these are studies from John Burgess, Nate Lawson. A, a number of people are finding that polished zirconia is a very kind surface to the antagonist tooth. Now, if you leave it rough or if you glaze it, that's another story. But uh, but polish would be would be absolutely fine to use in those situations. Uh, what do you use to clean after trying? That's what I was reading. Uh, I, you know, I, the katana cleaner is really a nice material for cleaning the restoration. Uh, and you do if once you try in your zirconia restoration. You do have to clean it. If you leave a little bit of slime, you can't use, you can't just etch it, you can't just rinse and dry it because the phosphate ions will stick to the same receptors as the bonding agent. So you'll basically have no bond to your restoration. That's why materials like Katana Cleaner came into play. Um, some people have used IvoClean as well. Katana Cleaner is just a little bit more universal. Uh, you can use it on teeth, you can use it on restorations, but it's the purpose of it is to remove those phosphate ions, and that is important to uh, if you want to bond your restoration. All right, now I think we answered everything. Okay, perfect. Cool. perfect. Good questions, just a little shy audience today. It's okay. <laughs> awesome, well, thank you, Kat and Dr. Butterman for your time today. And thank you to Karari for sponsoring this webinar. We did record it, so we'll send it out to everyone within one week of today. If you do have additional questions, please feel free to email webinars at henryshine.com or you can email Dr. Butterman, his email is in the chat, as well as info for Karari is in the chat as well. That's all I got. Thanks for attending everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you.